is uh, that remains as the, the primary uh, methodology, and uh, do you think it it can cope with the increasing demands that we're placing on uh, the way in which we view uh, pros prosperity within our economies? Well, I mean, I think GDP is a, a useful, although flawed, measure. Um, I suppose it's the, the best measure we have of, of uh, economic growth, um, except for all the other measures. Uh, I suppose GDP was very much designed with a specific purpose around um, maintaining short-term employment as a kind of Keynesian idea. Um, and in itself, it obviously has many um, issues, methodological issues, in terms of how do you measure GDP, what doesn't, doesn't count. Though where I think GDP does matter and where I, I think it is worth putting in the defense of GDP is that overall, um, humanity is better placed for the fact that we have more GDP growth or, or bigger economies. Um, it means individuals can consume a more expansive array and higher quality of products, spend more time in good health, and live longer and more fulfilled lives. Uh, more broadly, GDP does actually correlate very well with other good things that we like, be it um, general happiness and human satisfaction, longer life expectancy, declining um, malnutrition, literacy, numeracy, healthcare, medication, uh, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I think you can um, have this temptation to throw out GDP as a measure without necessarily appreciating its, both its limits and its, uh, I suppose, value in, in terms of what it tells us about the, the state of our economy and, and economic growth. Thank you. I mean, Kate, you've used, I'm, I've been reminded you're not meant to bring a prop into our evidence session, so what I'd like you to do is to take a photograph of it and send it to us as uh, part of your evidence. It's in the report. Uh, um, in the it's in the report, yeah. indeed. Um, <laughs> we've, we've heard in our previous session uh, how uh, biodiversity loss and climate change is impacting on, on well-being of society and has impacts on uh, the ability of the society to cope with, uh, with, with economic prosperity. Um, Henrietta mentioned Das Gupta. We, we, we did a lot of work on biodiversity loss last year, and the, the whole um, nature of natural, sorry, the whole concept of natural capital and bringing that into the public accounting realm is a subject currently under review by the Treasury, and we're going to be talking to them about it next week. Um, could you just give us your uh, overview of, of how it is that you think that GDP as a measure should be enhanced, or do you think it should be replaced? Thank you. And sorry, I didn't realise I wasn't allowed to bring this. So, um, but it is in the briefing that you will have. Um, could I just start by saying I, I respectfully but strongly disagree with uh, what Matthew has just argued, that actually it's true that GDP correlates with life expectancy and improved literacy, at very low levels of income. So countries that are up to around $15,000 per person per year, yes, it makes a massive difference in Malawi and Bangladesh. But when we get to high income countries, the correlation practically disappears. It's all about policy, it's all about distribution and investing in health and education. It's not about GDP growth. So we're in one of the world's richest countries. And the idea that increasing our GDP growth is going to increase the things we most care about just doesn't hold up in the evidence. It's also the case that amongst high income countries, more GDP is leading to more carbon emissions, a bigger footprint in the world when we take account of our material, our emissions not just at home, and our footprint not just at home, but our emissions around the world. So the evidence shows that actually countries that have growing and high GDPs are the ones that are struggling most to cut their carbon emissions on anything like the scale that's required. When we come to the question you're asking me, I don't believe that modifying GDP is the approach we need to go. I believe that we need to look at a dashboard, which is what I just showed. Um, and indeed, if any one of us goes to the doctor, we don't want the doctor to give us one number of how you're doing. I want the doctor to tell me about my blood pressure, my um, diabetes level, my uh, body mass ratio, my cardiovascular system, because my body and all our bodies are made up of many interdependent, delicately balanced living systems, and in that lies health. And it's the same systems that make planetary health. So we need that disaggregated information. Simon Kuznets in the 1930s was asked by the US Congress to come up with one number, and he did, and that's what we now call GDP. I will bet my life that if he was sitting right here in the 21st century, 
with the array of data that we now have to understand the living world and human life in its own terms, he would be the first to say, what are you still doing using my one number? That was a desperate time in a war economy of the early, mid-20th century. You are in utterly different times. We know utterly different things about the breakdown of the living world. Let's recognize this at the week where the IPCC have just released their latest report on the impacts of climate change, and it's catastrophic and devastating. He didn't know that. The, the early policymakers didn't know that, but we do. And therefore, how do we respond? And we respond by recognizing the delicate balance of our planetary home. And we need metrics that do justice to recognizing their connectivity. That's why I believe we need a dashboard. Also to recognize that GDP, when GDP goes up, whose GDP is that? Is it going up for the lowest and worst off in society? It's not. And, and very often we, we celebrate the rise of GDP, but we fail to say that actually the worst off have got no better off. Their incomes have been stagnant for decades. So we need metrics that disaggregate and do justice to the, to the detail that we care about when we talk about the success of our society. So I would say GDP, let it be useful. Let it be a measure of the flow of monetized activity in the economy. There we are. That's what it tells us. But we want to know so much more, and we can know so much more, and therefore let's draw on the richness of data that are now available and improving every day to actually tell ourselves about what thriving means in the 21st century, because it's something very different from mere spending the economy. So you, you acknowledge that it has a role to play in assessing financial performance of an economy. I'd acknowledge it, it tells you how much money is being spent buying stuff. What, what are people buying? Are they buying weapons? Are they cleaning up an oil spill? Or are we buying more space and doctors in the NHS? It matters hugely. So the overriding number, to me, doesn't tell us anything like what we actually want to know. It might be useful in national accounting to know the through flow. It might tell you something about tax revenues. But it doesn't tell you anything close to what we want to know when we come to talk about welfare, ecological integrity, and social justice. Well, though surely the telling us something about tax revenues allows policymakers then to decide how they're going to spend those tax revenues if they can see that tax... By, we only... As a government, and we're not members of the government, but as a government we can only spend the revenues that we're generating or we're borrowing, and those spending choices come out of a rising economy as measured by GDP, do they not? I would argue, actually, that as a country with our own sovereign currency, we regularly create money when we need money. That's what quantitative easing is. So the government always is creating money when that money is needed and removes money from the system through taxation. So I, I would argue, actually, and it's a very text, it's absolutely still taught in economics courses that money available to government is what's raised through taxes. I would argue it's not, a, not the case at all. When we have control over our own currency, which is one of the reasons I, I think the UK didn't go into the Eurozone back in the 90s to retain control over our own currency, it means we can spend money, we can pay for the things that we value Definitely. if we have the capacity to do it. So actually, we have a huge possibility here as a nation with a sovereign currency. We're not limited by tax receipts, and therefore GDP doesn't tell us that limitation in the way it might for some other <coughs> countries. Matthew, did you want to come back on that? Because I thought you. Yeah, were... I think there's, there's a, a few points I'd like to come back on. Uh, I, I was going to um, originally make the, the point you just made about how our ability to invest in things that are going to grow our economy, or even to tackle environmental issues, is very much dependent on the size of our economy. So um, our resilience uh, to, let's say, um, climate. Uh, events is very much determined by our overall GDP. The, the classic example here being the extent to which the Netherlands um, can function extremely well despite the fact that around a third of the country is below sea level because they have a much higher GDP. And countries with lower GDPs are going to inevitably struggle a lot more in, in facing environmental issues. Um, I I'm, uh, will have to very much respectfully disagree with the notion that we can just print money um, and the, the printer goes room without any negative consequences. I think the, the high, very high levels of inflation we're seeing right now are a direct consequence of the kind of modern monetary um, worldview that suggests that our resources are unlimited and we can just keep in creating currency. We can keep doing that, of course, but the, the value of the, the productive capacity of the economy will eventually be met. And once the productive capacity of the economy is met, we will have inflation. So therefore, if you want um, you know, to, to grow the economy, you can't just print money. You need to to, um, I would say, policymakers need to do various reforms in order to, to, to grow the supply side. That's probably a separate discussion. Um, overall, though, I, I also want to, though, respond to that point about um, 
the environment and, and are we managing to reduce emissions? I mean, the evidence is quite clear that the UK economy has been growing um, over the last couple of decades with a relatively flat line or slightly um, reducing level of, of carbon emissions. So we are managing to, to decouple growth um, from carbon emissions to some extent, maybe not fast enough, um, as well as decouple economic growth from resource use. Um, that's a kind of a definitional thing in some respects, which is the way you achieve economic growth in the modern context, I think, is using resources more efficiently and being more productive, or through digital means, which are very low in terms of their material use. So that, that kind of decoupling, I think, is um, absolutely essential to the discussion and shows that GDP doesn't necessarily have to come at the cost of the environment. We're going to come on to that again in a second, but Sorry. I'd just like to bring in Henrietta, uh, if I may. Um, so you've written on the subject of how we define prosperity. Uh, I've actually written on the subject of prosperity oh. and wrote a report for government on growing the contribution of defence to UK prosperity, because the, and it was prompted to do this because the Treasury uh, gave recognised no multiplier effect for a pound spent on defence, uh, um, which seemed to me to be uh, somewhat... Uh, uh, short-sighted. Uh, I don't want to get into a defence debate here. No, well, that's not um, my could, <laughs> could you give us the benefit of your views of uh, whether GDP is a good measure of prosperity? Uh, well, I don't think that GDP is a good proxy for prosperity, no. Um, and I think that the, it's a 20th century metric and it's not fit for the 21st century. Um, we're now in a completely different situation. We need to substantially uh, regenerate the planet in many ways and we need to improve the quality of people's lives. So exactly as Kate said, I mean it's a good measure of activity within the economy but it doesn't tell us anything about um, distribution or about sustainability. So what are the two big challenges of the 21st century government at the moment? Inequality and environmental degradation, neither of which are captured by this particular metric. So I think one of the things we would have to ask is not whether GDP is <clears throat> good or bad as it stands, but is it fit for purpose now for the things we really need to do? So in other words, have we been pouring lots of money into regional inequality in the United Kingdom without seeing the returns to that investment? And the answer to that is yes, because we don't really understand what's going on in our regions. So regional inequality is one thing, but there are very, very large inequalities within regions. So we just did an analysis uh, last year of eight regions of the UK, and we looked at the best performing small area within them and the worst performing small area. And in all those situations, what we discovered is that the worst performing small areas are a good deal more toxic than the best performing areas. In other words, there's a very, very close relationship between poor performance on lots and lots of metrics and environmental degradation, as you would expect. So when we're looking at those kinds of things, we're asking ourselves, OK, if we're pouring money into a leaky bucket without understanding exactly where the big holes are and why do things go the way they do, then this isn't a good use of taxpayers' funds, I don't think. So what we have done is to say, let's develop uh, a new understanding of prosperity and where does it start? So it starts, first of all, by asking the people who are most affected by this, which is the citizens of the United Kingdom and asking them to talk about what matters to them for prosperity in their areas, and then to talk to all the other stakeholders in their areas about what matters for prosperity. Now, normally when we do this, the first criticism that's made is we can't really deal in government with all this information. We don't really want to know what all these people think about this. It's too much and it's in the way, and actually what we really need is sort of four or five things that will give us an idea. So um, we took that on board seriously. So what we did is we said, OK, let's put together this very detailed information with the big structural drivers and constraints, so, you know, deindustrialization, etc. So what is going on in the macroeconomy? And the first thing you discover when you do that is that actually the way we think about economics is we think about the micro and the macro. And the macro is meant to be an aggregate of the micro, which... One, and one of the problems here is that when you start looking at redefining prosperity, that doesn't hold, because what really matters is the space in the middle. It's the space and the place where people are living their lives, where this very specific nature 
of, say, climate change or deindustrialization or a lack of belonging or a lack of education or whatever it is takes a specific form because of the particularities of those places. So we all understand this. We know that Yorkshire isn't Cornwall. I'll stop there. Thank you. Can I just ask one question before I move us on? Mm. What's the, uh, the, the unit that you're measuring your areas in? Because one of the challenges that I have representing a rural area, which is regarded as a leafy shire county and therefore by definition rich, is that we have pockets of deprivation within yeah. it which are probably close to the pockets of deprivation in some of the most deprived other larger areas. And the measurement of a... You mentioned Yorkshire and Cornwall. Well, we've got a, both a Yorkshire and a Cornish representative yes. here. They might want to come back to you on that. Yeah. I'm sure they would agree with me that there is significant deprivation within each of their communities, but they're bro broadly regarded as more prosperous than some others. Yes, and that's exactly, that's exactly why I started the work that I'm doing, because of having to account for those pockets of deprivation and our inability to make any change in their circumstance. So basically, technically speaking, you're probably looking at a lower super output area, but you know, so a small, a small area, because you need to understand specifically what's been going on in those places and why things are not shifting. It seems to me that government tends to allocate funds based on a per capita basis, and there is a significant skewing towards density, because there's a presumption across government, from, from, which has been in existence for several decades, that density equals deprivation. Is that something that you've recognised? Well, it does in certain circumstances and not in, and not in others, and it, it depends exactly on what's going on. So yes, of course, we're all familiar with the idea that density in inner city areas equals certain kinds of challenges and, and problems. But, but what I'm saying is that what we've been doing is going into certain places. Uh, so we've done, um, say, for example, five very different boroughs in London and looked at the actual circumstances in those boroughs and the, and the, the history and circumstance of what has happened to them and why they are as they are and then put that together with all of the Office of National Statistics data so that you can see the major drivers. So in other words, to create this very, very detailed place-based understanding of what will be the mechanisms you'll need to move to get things to change in a specific place. I'm going to bring Robert in very yeah, briefly just, before yes, we so move on. I a Yorkshire constituency, and, and often I'm telephoned by the media saying it's terrible, you know, people on very low incomes. But the fact is, in, my, in Scarborough itself, you can buy a perfectly decent flat for £100,000, so two people earning 25000 each can easily get a mortgage, whereas... In London, where we're told everybody's rich, nobody can get on the pro property ladder. So, you know, looking at property prices and the other costs of living, uh, transportation to work, you know, people can walk to work in Scarborough because they can afford to live where their office is, whereas in London they have to spend £5,000 on a season ticket. I mean, can that be factored in in terms of the, yeah. the way we look at wealth? Yes, it can, because it's really about what we do with the wealth we, we create, right? It's not what the absolute levels of wealth are. So if you look at the United Kingdom as a whole, and you would, if you took the Legatum Prosperity Index, for example, which is a very specific thing, then they would tell you, you know, that the Highlands and the Islands are the happiest places in the United Kingdom, you know, and, the, and Chelsea is pretty miserable. I don't know how I'm many of you are resident in Chelsea, so don't please come back if you are. But, um, you know, and, and that's because of the things you're mentioning, walking to work, right? Walking to work is quality of life, isn't it? Mm. Walking to work is quality of life. Mm. Right, walking to work, if you, you know, have to walk to work because there is no transport um, and you just have to start running to work early in the morning is not good quality yeah. of life. So, you know, context, context, right? Diversity, context. Thank you. Caroline Lucas. Thanks very much, Chair. I wanted to come back to Kate and ask whether you think that policymakers are trying to have their cake and eat it when they argue that it will be possible to tackle the climate and nature crises and to continue growing economic growth at the same time. Yes, I do, and I worry that there's a widespread adoption of the concept of green growth, which sounds great. I mean, it would be wonderful if that were possible, but it, the, the concept is running, running far ahead of the evidence. So actually, there are many uh, studies across countries, empirical studies by academic scholars worldwide, that are showing that there's, we're not seeing anything like the speed or scale of what's called decoupling of carbon emissions, but also our material footprints worldwide. And I just want to come back to the, the data that was cited earlier on the UK. So... I think Bayes and others have often said, you know, the UK over the last 20 years, roughly, we've seen GDP grow by about 
75% and carbon emissions fall by about 44%. That sounds wonderful. That sounds job done. We've got green growth, haven't we? Actually, that's too quick. First of all, it's not only about carbon. I won't pick this up again, but there are multiple planetary boundaries. We are overshooting not only on, on climate change, but on resource use, land use, water use. Think of all the food, the clothing, the, the uh, electronic devices that we're using. None of them were made in this country. So they're all imported. Now, the, the data that's often cited is only for emissions and resource use from this country. When we take account of our global material footprint and our global carbon footprint, that reduction dramatically reduces. And if we look at it year on year, it's around one and a bit percent. And that, to me, is the point. Yes, there is some reduction in our carbon emissions and our material use, but it's not falling at anything like the speed or scale that these times demand, that this decade of ecological and climate emergency demands, that the, the IPCC tell us our country, as one of the richest countries in the world and also historical responsibility, should be moving. And therefore, we need to take much more drastic measures and seriously implement the policies we've already introduced. The, the Climate Change Committee say hmm. this government is not yet at all on track for most of, the majority of, the climate targets it set for itself. That means we need far more ambitious policies. We need to act and regulate and reduce and ban um, internal combustion engine cars. The city of Amsterdam is going to have no internal combustion engine cars from, from the year 2030. They're moving faster. We need to take so many more measures. And if we are serious about these measures that require us to come back within planetary boundaries, this is the point. If we actually act and put in place those measures, they may well hamper the GDP growth that we have come to assume is normal, the 2%, 3% that is aspired to. And that's where this issue, the rubber hits the road of this issue. Are we going to actually be serious about the ecological targets and the social targets that we hold for ourselves? Or are we never going to quite implement them because we're too wedded to GDP growth? So sitting beneath this question of do we, do we look at a different metric is a much bigger question of can we actually reduce us, our dependency upon unending GDP growth. And I, I think we, I hope we'll come to discuss that later because it's, it's, the, it's the real question that sits under why when everybody in the room agrees that the GDP does not serve everything we care about, do we just keep coming back to it year after year? Because there's a structural dependency on growth that needs to be released if we're going to actually enable people to thrive on this delicately balanced living planet, the only known one in the universe. And I know that sounds dramatic to say, but it is the only known one in the universe. And all the scientists are telling us we are rapidly in the process of destroying the life support systems of our planetary home. The UK is one of the most nature depleted countries in the world. If getting higher GDP was evidence that our, our environments would improve, we would not be one of the most nature depleted nations in the world. Let me move to the to speak of the, the River Wye. I know this, this committee has come out with reports talking about the state of the UK's rivers. There's a lot of investment in chicken farms there. That's boosting GDP. Nice. But they're producing massive excess nitrogen and phosphorus, which is running off into the river and killing that river and killing our waterways. We're destroying UK nature. And I really appreciate and I agree with the recommendation from this committee, which is what we should do then, is set a capacity. What is the capacity of that river catchment area to absorb, to safely absorb that runoff? And that should be the capacity of farms that are then allowed to be built there. And then let's see which farms can be most effective and innovative in reducing that. That principle of reducing our, of recognizing the capacity of the living world to absorb our activities should be not only at the level of the catchment of the River Wye, it's at the level of the UK, it's at the level of the world. And we need it not just in carbon emissions, but in our respect for biodiversity and for water use and all of our material use. We need to put those targets at the heart of our policy making. And then that means we need to release ourselves from this dependency upon unending growth. Thank you. Indeed, I think we are coming on to the issue of the, of the underlying um, dependencies on, on, on growth later in the questioning, but I was going to come to Matthew and, and, and just put it to you that what you've just heard from Kate Rayworth completely undermines the case, I would argue, in some of the uh, papers that you've submitted in your evidence, basically still clinging on to the idea of the environmental Kuznets curve. I mean, can, can, you, can you really say that you think that that, that, that environmental Kuznets curve is a, is, is a relevant 
uh, measure of anything very useful right now, given that we've heard, for example, that um, quite a lot of the uh, boundaries that we're concerned about are around river quality or natural footprint or, 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 or some of those biodiversity issues. There are those different nine uh, constraints, for example, or the fact, indeed, that it can look as if we're doing terribly well when our GDP gets higher, but that's because we've exported half of our dirty industries to poorer countries, and then the pollution ends up on their balance sheet, not on ours. Uh, why, don't I, why don't I take that first point briefly about um, exporting emissions? It, it is true that um, you, uh, in terms of production emissions, there's been a, a bigger decline than in consumption emissions, but in terms of per capita consumption emissions from, from the government's data, it does appear like there has been some decoupling um, there. And uh, again, we get There's enough to... decoupling. Well, I'm, 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 not, um, I'm not an IPCC expert to tell you whether or not that with its precise... Well, you I should think... know that. If you're coming to this committee well, no. telling us that... Wait a minute. If you're coming to this committee telling us that growth is essential, both for social justice, but also, I think you're saying too, in terms of uh, reducing our environmental uh, damage then surely you would need to know whether or not that decoupling was sufficient. Is it happening fast enough? Is it happening comprehensively enough in order to be able to get us to a safe space? Look, I, I do discuss later in my evidence that I think that the clear way to solve this issue is through uh, pricing carbon, and that will ensure the decoupling much faster and much more efficiently. What about the things impact. that aren't carbon, though? I mean, we've just talked about river quality or about some of those other... Species loss. Species loss. I mean, you can, use, you can use, to the extent to which you can, I mean, uh, you can use price-based mechanism, price mechanisms for other types of pollution and air quality. That's been something that's been talked about for, for many decades. Um, to the extent to which you want to achieve other goals, obviously you need different um, solutions. I just want to go quickly, though, if I, if I may, um, responding to that point about the environmental Kunitz curve, um, which I think there is still some validity to. Just you to say, could you just talk a little bit slower? Sorry. Okay. I know I speak fast, but I'm struggling to keep I, up. I apologise. I, I very <laughs> much apologise. Uh, just, just back to that point about the environmental Kunitz curve. Um, I think there is evidence to suggest that as countries um, perform better on, on GDP measures, initially there is a worsening in the environmental impact, and, and that's very much what the UK experienced during the Industrial Revolution, for example, when there was a lot less concern about environmental issues. The, the Thames was severely polluted, for example, to the extent to which it um, stunk out uh, Parliament, famously. Um, over time, though, the attitudes change. And I, I think, for example, your position in Parliament reflects that. There is a lot more environmental concern over time as people become more prosperous. And there's also the ability to use those resources for environmental purposes. Um, I, I think we, we, for example, in tackling climate change, uh, although I know that's not your only focus, but it is a major one, um, a, a bigger economy means greater resources to invest in um, uh, carbon-reducing technologies like solar panels. Not, or, if, if, your, if your industrial processes, which are leading to your GDP growth, are themselves damaging the environment at a rate of cost that is greater than the money you're generating through the GDP that you're, that you're raising, then you're on a hiding to nothing, aren't you? Well, potentially, I'm not necessarily persuaded that, uh, again, that, environmental, that economic growth has to come at environmental cost. I think, obviously, it, it does sometimes. Where's, where's the example, then, of absolute decoupling anywhere in the world where you've had absolute decoupling at the scale that's necessary to keep us below 1.5, let's say, if we're talking about carbon? Well, I, I don't think we've had that, because I think the policy setting is wrong because we haven't priced carbon. I, I think there's a policy problem here in terms of are we going to price carbon and, and, and then there's another bunch of issues about the... Um, negative impact on low-income households, about the negative impact on existing industries. It's, it's not an easy thing, um, by no means, to, to price carbon, but I think you can solve that issue by pricing carbon without, and you would still achieve economic growth. Countries that are priced carbon, have, or um, localities that are priced carbon, have still managed to um, increase economic growth, and there's some good studies suggest that pricing carbon um, has actually not had negative impact How whatsoever. would you use that argument? I mean, um, Kate gave the example uh, of, of the River Y. What pricing me mechanism are you going to use to get the, the pollutants out of the river? Why? I mean, it, the, in the classic economic terms, you'd, you'd probably uh, look to assign it some kind of property rights about the extent to... I mean, I'm, I'm not too familiar with that example, so please excuse my ignorance, but um, I, I think you'd probably look at some kind of property rights or price-based solution where you um, effectively ensure that the extent to which um, you might need to put things into the river is limited um, by, let's say you said, a maximum level of deposits that you could put into the river. And you're right, you do need a regulatory intervention to stop the, the kind of pollution. Um, and let, uh, you could, like we do with fishing stocks, allow you a trading of those permissions about what needs to be deposited into the river. I don't know exactly what that would be in that specific case, but I think there are market-based solutions you could use to address that by, by setting the maximum of, of whatever um, the, the pollution issue is in this case. Let me come to Professor Moore. Yes. <laughs> Are we framing this uh, in the right way? 
um, should not. we be looking at decoupling our current model of growth from environmental harm? And given your work compiling the citizen-led prosperity indices that you were referring to earlier, how would you approach this? What, what, what way would you approach this? I think that, uh, I, uh, that um, what we actually need to do is to recouple social and economic prosperity in a new way and embed it in environmental prosperity. Right? So, to, so let's not discuss decoupling for a moment. Let's discuss recoupling the things that matter that will drive future livability. So right now, we're, we're worried about quality of life and future livability and the future sustainability of the planet. Now, as we're having this technical argument about whether or not markets will actually bring us where we want them to go, we know that they won't alone. No, never. Okay? Because a market is just a mechanism for a set of exchanges, it's exactly as it says. The best things that we've managed to do in the United Kingdom in the last while have been circumstances where we've been shaping markets very, very dramatically. And a good example of that is renewable energy. Mm -hmm. right? So the costs of renewable energy have gone down by photovoltaics by something like 80% in the last 10 years. Now, this wasn't achieved by the market by itself, right? It was achieved by shaping the market around renewable energy, by certainly encouraging various kinds of innovation, but also primarily by doing things like rethinking energy distribution for ordinary communities, allowing communities to do things with their energy control, taking control of their energy. So some of the best examples around the UK are where people have taken control of, of producing and distributing their own energy, made a bit of money by selling it back to the grid, so there is a market role here, and then decided to use it for what? Giving uh, extra lessons to their children in the evening so that they have improved skills, making investments in social housing. The, the, the UK is replete with these examples, very, very good examples of people making those kinds of changes. So if we just, you know, again, we can argue about whether or not they're the best examples, but, you know, on the climate initiative. So, you know, Cornwall brings together a very, very large number of partners on the climate, climate initiative, and that means that people are sharing knowledge and they're doing things at the local level. Essex does the same thing. So Essex has just announced that it's going to... Um, come to net zero by 2035, that it's going to do a, a particular area of Essex first. So we are starting to work with Essex now on what would be a whole systems change for local areas in the United Kingdom, which means that you have to take seriously the intersections that Kate has been talking about. So you're looking at air, water, transport, soil, carbon, the whole lot together, and when you do that, you actually create new kinds of jobs, new kinds of markets, new kinds of products, new kinds of value. So there you're not necessarily talking about, do we want to have you know, uh, a decoupling? What you're talking about is actually a system change that's taking you in the right direction. And as a result of this, is also creating new forms of employment, new ways of managing local areas, uh, you know, even products and things that we can't even begin to think of. I don't even know what they are. You know? I mean, I never knew, you know, when I was a child, there was nobody called you know, a sort of um, web designer. The job didn't exist, okay? And that very likely the future is going to look like that in this area too. So we have enormous opportunities in the UK, but if we keep on with this GDP and these arguments about, you know, which is to be proven this and are we, you know, if we keep talking about that, one of the things we're going to do is to embed in our own economic thinking and the way we align our economic thinking with our goals a particular kind of path dependency which is set by GDP, which means that we're going to miss most of these new opportunities, okay? We're not even going to be able to grasp them. And just, that's much more worrying than some of the other things. Just thought, sorry, that Kate wanted to come back in very quickly. Well, I wanted to pick up because Henry, Henry had to start talking about places within the UK, and I, I wanted to add. So the donut diagram that I drew and I published in Donut Economics, what amazed me since it came out in 2017 is the number of places, cities, uh, towns, neighbourhoods, county councils around the world that have connected with us and said, we actually want to use this locally. So we founded Donut Economics Action Lab in order to work with them. So Cornwall, Cornwall County Council have actually created their own adapted version of the donut, the social on the inside, the ecological on the outside, and they now use it as a decision-making wheel in every 
po policy that's coming through every planning. So they're, it, they're, they're taking a new metric and putting it into policy making, and that of course is the key. We can all have any metrics we like on paper on a website. It's how they shape policy making. Glasgow City Council are now currently creating what's the Donut City portrait. How is our city doing? Are people here thriving? And what are their impact on people and the rest of the world? Uh, Leeds are using it in terms of transforming their city over the next 10 years, but also Amsterdam, Barcelona, Copenhagen, Nanaimo in Canada. Uh, so what, I, what I'm finding fascinating, and by the way, we, we don't go and knock on anybody's doors. This is all places coming to us and saying, we want to go beyond GDP, because as a city, as a county, as a region, we know that that is not the measure of our well-being. We want to take into account a diverse dashboard of metrics, and they're adapting it in each place to their own needs, their own realities, their own context, their interests. So we're not trying to make something that's comparable across places. There's a role for that, but actually it's about something that works here, which is what New Zealand have done with their living standards framework. Let's make something that works here. And I think the UK has an amazing opportunity to also lead on that and say, let's make a new vision. What is our vision of the thriving nation that we want to be, both socially and ecologically? The social and natural metrics are now available to to measure that in life in its own terms. We don't have to turn everything into a monetary value. We flatten so much information when we try and turn it into a monetary value. And I think there's a real opportunity for leadership here, but I, I, I wanted to share that it's, it's bubbling up from councils and Rydell and York and Humber. It's bubbling up from places that saying we're just going to start doing this anyway. Thank you, Kate. You've given us a very clear um, examples of that. I'm just going to, we're going to, we've got to move on a bit. Barry's got a very quick question before I bring in Matthew. Yes, I, look, I, I welcome all that's been said about focusing on wealth and well-being rather than on <laughs> monetized economic activity. Uh, Mr. Lesh, I, I wanted just to pick up on something of the evidence that you had given us, though, um, where you argued that econo economic GDP growth led to a cleaner environment. You said environmental progress is most striking in the more affluent developed countries which have reduced air pollution, cleaned previously putrid rivers like the Thames, and opened green spaces for public enjoyment. Um, but isn't that a fallacy of the baseline? They've only become polluted rivers, they only become polluted air um, because of that economic growth. So if you take a baseline that's in the worst possible conditions and say, look, when we came really, really rich, we actually got rid of some of that, um, it's just the fallacy of the baseline. And even then, um, what we're talking about is a, a geographic fallacy because what we've now done is we've exported many of the pollutants abroad, you know, and, and that's what's happening. We are actually exporting our emissions now. So it seems to me that what you've submitted in your evidence is entirely fallacious. Um, I, I mean, I obviously respectfully disagree okay. about the, the quality of... Sorry, uh, I should say the chair requested your answer yeah, well, to Well, I should have asked you to make a <laughs> short question rather than the statement. Can we have... Quick response to that. I mean, I, I'll, I'll briefly respond just by saying that um, yeah. you could look back in an alternative world, of course, where uh, Britain never industrialised and where the world was significantly poorer than today. I don't think that would be a better alternative. And some environmental degradation, I think, is, is probably inevitable in, in some in you know human history and human development. I don't think we can we can could go back or if if we wanted to achieve the kind of economic progress we have achieved without any impact on the environment, just purely from let's say a resource um, exploration perspective. Uh, so the question is then, can we, as we build more resources, um, treat the environment better? The, the answer, I would say, would be yes. Thank you, Matthew. Uh, Matthew Offery. Um, Professor Moore, uh, using the matrix of GDP, um, it is uh, very possible that we've um, skewed economic development across the country in different ways as oh. different levels of um, the United Kingdom has uh, different GDP levels. Um, to what extent do you think that shifting away from how we measure uh, prosperity will help the UK to level up? Well, I think the first thing that will help is that we need to be more, much more solution focused than we are. Okay? So at the moment, I don't see what we would need is a series of plans for how we plan to improve the prosperity in terms of quality of life and livability for each part of the United Kingdom. I see no evidence that, that we have such plans. And, and I mean that because when you look at the plan for these things, you see that people say they're going to become carbon net zero by a certain date and that GVA is going to improve and there's going to be a lot of investment by high-end industry, which is going to bring in great... Uh, new jobs and new skills. 
And usually when you look at these things in detail and look at the, what's happened historically, you find that indeed we do get innovative industry that goes into some places. It has nowadays very, very few jobs in it. So its actual impact on any of the things that we care about in any of these areas is actually very, very small. So what I would think we would need to be doing is to be thinking quite differently about what are the pathways to prosperity. And that means thinking about how do you take a whole systems approach at each local level and start to move the particular kind of intersections between what's going on with all of these systems, economic, social and living, so that you push those areas into situations of better quality of life. And so that's what we've been doing, and we haven't been, we're doing it for these five boroughs, but we're also now doing it, as Kate has been saying, for Leeds and for Liverpool and for Glasgow and for other parts of the United Kingdom, actually working with local communities who are already taking some of these actions to work out what would actually have to be done, as opposed to just saying, well, if GVA goes up, then everything will be fine. Do we not have to share the characteristics across the country um, and GDP is currently the only financial one. Uh, for example, um, my PhD was on economic development and social exclusion in Cornwall. Yes. And the whole issue of about the, what is the economy in Cornwall. Mm. Now, we can all agree the economy is the financial output of the county, yeah. which is very low compared mm. to other parts of the country. Yeah. But the discussion has continued and still continues to this day about mm. what parts of the economy are productive because mm. the parts that in my opinion, are productive for tourism, but are low paid. Mm -hmm. um, but there remains a fanciful view amongst some that uh, agriculture is the driver of the economy. I've heard that expression so many times. Mm -hmm. But what does the economy of Cornwall, um, what does that share with the economy of the London Borough of Barnet, for example? Um, but the one area I would say that it does share mm -hmm. is GP, GDP output. Well, I'd, I would say that I would say that by measuring the by looking at Cornwall and looking at um, say Parking and Dagenham or any other London borough together and saying okay GDP is is you know equivalent in one and equivalent in the other it tells you absolutely nothing about whether those quality of life or livability Except or any that. other thing right yeah. in fact it, in fact it takes you off in completely the wrong in completely in the wrong direction. And I think if we, were, I don't know when we were, if we're going at, in, in your discussion, if you had intended in your discussion this afternoon that we might talk about some alternative metrics for GDP and also some ideas about how the, the British public might be involved in this discussion about the realignment of the economy, then we could we could get on to some of those things because I think there are things that could be done immediately uh, on that front. <clears throat> We are going to come on to that. Yep. Okay, okay. Yes. If we come on to that, I'll yep. leave that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Mr. Leash, uh, what challenges do you see in incorporating uh, qualitative measures of social capital or well being into our system of national accounts? I mean, in, in the first instance, you're obviously going to have methodological issues. Uh, I suspect those, in some way, are, are possible to overcome. Um, I'm a little bit skeptical of, of aggregate measures in the sense of something like the Human Development Index, for example, doesn't actually really tell you very much in respect to um, what needs to be improved or what needs to be fixed. Um, and I'm more of a fan of disaggregated measures. I, I think um, opens the idea of dashboards. Uh, it's not necessarily something, um, you know, more information and, and can be useful, but you've just got to make sure that it, it actually tells you something. What I think the broader issue, though, is that um, there's not necessarily a consensus about what people want to maximise in their lives. Um, and this is why, in a sense, this is an argument against any kind of economic measurement or of any kind of measurement of, of, of anything um, when you're trying to maximise as, as policymakers because people have such divergent um, priorities in terms of what they want. You know, one person's priority might be, mm. I want the best possible um, film content online. That's the only thing I care about. I love film. That, that's, that's it. That, that is what, what everything matters to me. But somebody else might have a very different view. Mm. Uh, they, they might say, film's terrible. I actually want better TV. It's, it's the fact that the idea of what people want and what, and what people need is, is very much an individualised. It, it's not even, a, I wouldn't even say a community-based thing, but a very individual thing. And that's why I think measures... And or just trying to maximise a particular measure, whatever that measure may be, can be flawed. No, I, I, okay, the, I, again, I accept that point, but you, you started off, off by saying that uh, this could all be established through a methodological approach. Fine, what should be our methodological approach? I mean, I, I don't have a particularly strong view in terms of what the methodological 
approach should be. I'm, I'm, I'm going to say I'm not a statistician. It's probably a little bit out, outside of my, my field of knowledge. I mean, I think you, again, I would say you can't just use one measure. You would have to use lots of different measures as localised as possible um, to have any particular meaning. So you, you and, and figure out what is, and as some of the other panels discussed, what is the priority in terms of what you want to improve and then focus on that. So an aggregate measure, one single measure is not going to tell you very much if it contains... What would Adam Smith want? What would Adam Smith want? Um, I don't think Adam Smith would have had much conceptualisation of the idea of economic measures. I, I don't think he would have had um, any idea that you could gather this kind of information. Um, he, he would have... Uh, although, you know, I'm not going to speak for Adam Smith. Um, and I have plenty, plenty, plenty of tried over the years, and I think it's quite a, a, a futile goal. Um, I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure he would, he would have any particular interest in it. I think what um, Adam Smith would be more interested in is um, you know, the, the general sense of, of prosperity that can be maximised across society, however people choose to view that in their own individual way. OK, thank you. Didn't ask you to speak for him, just perhaps interpret <laughs> what you thought he might. Yeah. But anyway, um, Kate, as I said to you as we started the session, I was very pleased that um, your book was brought to me when I, um, I was involved in the contributions to um, a conference I attended for the Environmental Sustain Sustainability Initiative at uh, Exeter University at Falmouth. So I am aware of, of your work and the um, enthusiasm that some people had for your ideas as well. But uh, in your submission, you discuss various growth dependencies that are built in, into our conventional system of government um, and finance. Do you see there are any ways that policymakers could begin to reduce those dependencies? So I think this is the key question. Uh, and I think we've inherited economic systems, and I think largely fueled by very low-cost fossil fuels, means that we have grown up with memories of generations of economies that just grow. So back when Kennedy was elected, he promised he got elected on the promise of five percent growth. That was that was the goal, right? Then maybe in the around the turn of the century, it was around three point five percent was the norm for OECD countries. Now it's sort of more two percent. It's falling. We've got to get get with the idea that actually the presumption of endless economic growth it has been, I think, a passing phase in history, and actually it's declining. It, we can see secular terms from, from the, the OECD and the IMF have looked across high-income countries and said the rate of growth is declining. And if we were to take seriously the ecological challenges we have, we would act much more in ways, I believe, that would in increasingly flatten it. So we need to recognise how are we structurally dependent upon assuming that our economies will grow endlessly. Would you, would you say that you believe that um, some parts of the economy should either stagnate or even decline in order for other parts, maybe other parts of the country, or other parts of the world, should be able to advance and not just base upon financial metrics, perhaps on biodiversity metrics um, and, and others, um, in order that they can either regain or continue to advance someone somewhere? has to lose out. So I believe ecologically we need to regenerate this planet and we need to regenerate this nation which is recognised as one of the most nature depleted in the world. In terms of the economic activity, absolutely, we need to let go of some things and leave them behind in the 20th century. Fossil fuels, thank you, you were useful, we now know too much, we need to let you go. Other things need to grow in their place, renewable, insulation, rewilding, ecological agriculture, and by the way, and a circular economy, and by the way, these create jobs. Because instead of using more new resources, which is what we've always done in the past, we employ people to use the resources we have far more effectively and slowly and creatively and carefully. So it's a win-win in terms of job creation and resource reduction. That's the economy we need to move towards. Mm -hmm. However, we need to recognise that this may generate a lower GDP growth than we have structurally become dependent upon. One example is around employment. In the past, companies have focused on chasing labour productivity. We want to employ fewer people to make the same amount of stuff or the same amount of people to make more stuff. If the economy is not growing, that is very going to quick, quickly turn into an unemployment line. And that, of course, is a huge concern for governments. So what can we do? One, we can switch from incentivising labour <coughs> productivity through taxing labour, which is almost an absurdity that we still tax companies for hiring people, to taxing companies for using new resources. That stimulates a circular economy. And it means companies employ more people to use those resources. But also, a lot of uh, research and, and experiments going on. Can we move people towards a four-day working week? 
paid more on a four-day week. Often people are actually more productive on that. But we are removing the need to endlessly grow to employ people. So that's one of the lock-ins. I'd say another one is that we have um, some people receive their income through wages. Some people th receive their income through rents, whether it's on owning land, rent of land, rent of housing, or, or dividends. If the economy is not employing more people through wages, you're going to get a very rapid increase in inequality, which we would have seen at the beginning of COVID if we hadn't had the furlough scheme, because rentiers will continue to charge rent while people who earn wages don't have any. So you'll see a huge inequality open up. And I think growth has long been recognized as a way of avoiding the pain of inequality that actually sits under a lot of our economic structures. So those are just two examples. But I, I, what I want to say is that this question of how are we structurally dependent upon endless growth and therefore what kind of policies could we begin to put in place is a massively under-researched topic, whether in universities or I think in policy departments, and it's a critical one. I'm actually involved in conversations exactly around this in the European Commission. So it's really interesting that the European Commission are starting to also say, how can we, they say, we're not saying whether or not we can have endless growth, we know we need to move beyond it. How can we move beyond it? These are very real questions that policymakers need a lot of um, institutional and educational um, academic support and think tank support because we've neglected it through our assumption that growth can be endless, and I think it's turning, becoming clear that it can't. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matthew. I'm conscious that we, we, we're almost out of our allotted time for this panel, so we've got two more sets of questions, and I'd encourage colleagues to keep them um, quite concise and answers, if we could, quite concise. Jerome Mayhew. Uh, that's been a really difficult position because I want to... Okay, fine. Um, <laughs> I had a qu an additional question. I just wanted to, to put to both of them. Okay, I'm going I'm to skip all that. Um, Professor Moore, uh, yes. you're part of the Descripta um, review, uh, for which I'm very grateful. I thought it was a really interesting report. What actions would you like to see the government or the ONS prioritise in response to the, the review? And are there any specific opportunities coming up where we can take advantage of this, where the government can put beyond GDP thinking into action? Um, yes, I mean, I think the, at the moment what's been happening is that uh, the government has announced a number of initiatives around the Descripta review, but what's lacking is a kind of framework to bring all these things together, and that's the real problem. So we need the new framework we start, before we start taking all this action. We do have the Office of National Statistics who are doing a fantastic job with you know, bringing natural capital into the national accounts and so on and so forth. There is really a big opportunity for us with the, what the UN is trying to do and you know, with the sort of you know, green, what's it called, green pathway, anyway, the, the new UNEP, UNDP initiative there. And I think the, the United Kingdom could actually show some considerable, as Kate was saying, some considerable leadership here, uh, and, and should do, because we have the capacity, because the ONS is so well advanced in, in, in what it's able to do. So that's one of the big opportunities, is to, play a big, is, is to play a big role there. But at the local level, what's very important is to understand that Parter and I disagreed quite a lot during the review over the notion of inclusive wealth, because inclusive wealth just means including natural capital into the way that wealth is created. It doesn't actually mean inc including sort of what's happening in terms of people, regions, redistribution, and so That's on. It's funny, I, that, that was my, uh, my follow-on, was mm. based on the descriptor of report, yeah. it feels like we're having a bit of a false argument here. Yes. Because we're, we're, you know, our tanks are all, should we have GDP, shouldn't we have GDP? Mm. But if you look at inclusive wealth, it's, you know, it's produced human and natural, yeah. and GDP's got a role to play in there. And aren't we really discussing GDP being an important set of figures, but not the only ones? And it's, we're adding additional metrics to, you know, instead of having one overriding metric, we have a, 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 a matrices of metrics that, are, that, that we can adjust for importance as we go along, and the ONS is already doing that. <laughs> Well, I think, the, I think what one would need to do is to think about what these additional metrics would be and what the public conversation around this needs to be. So I don't know if this is the right moment to, to, to bring these things in. But I think that the, at the moment, um, you know, the, we're, we're not able to align some of the outcomes we want because of the fixation with GDP. So it doesn't mean we necessarily need to get rid of GDP altogether, as Kate said, if you want to have some measure of activity within the economy, then that, this is fine. But, you know, we do actually have to realise that the way that we're running the economy 
is seriously depleted by the GDP focus because, as you all know, because you've been doing this work on water, you know, only 14% of our rivers meet the regulatory requirement. 14. So when are we waiting to get over the top part of the Kuznet curve? When is it happening, guys? I mean, it's, it's, a, long, it's a long way off, right? Listening to the chat, I'm going to cut yeah. short on that. Yeah. It's just that we've heard of evidence of the donut, um, and we've got the outer side, which, we're talking, which we've yeah. talked about quite a lot, which is what the planet can sustain. Yeah. But we've got to pay for the inner side of the donut as well. And surely I'm using GDP as a loose reference to money generation, the kind of money that governments and individuals can use to pay for the good stuff that we all want. Mm -hmm. And if we, if we say we're moving beyond GDP, how do we pay for it? Well, I think we pay for it by realigning the economy. So we've just published a paper on um, on fiscal reform for the for the UK, which shows that we could pay for carbon net zero, but that the biggest net, the biggest cost for it, is not going to be in the areas which which we're talking about currently, just in the conversation we've had now, but in the kind of work that we need to do for new um, social and political institutions. It's in the realm of the social and the political that we're going to pay huge costs in the future if we don't move quickly on doing something about um, climate and biodiversity. Thank you. Slash. Your submission argues that there are flaws in the um, the Dusgupta report's case for adopting inclusive wealth. Um, just develop that for me. What are they? I mean, in, in the first sense, as an alternative to GDP, it, it's, it's measuring something very different. I mean, a, a stock is not the same as a flow. And I think, I think that's an intentional um, change in focus by the review, but it, it means that whilst it, it's the, the notion of inclusive wealth is going to be useful um, to give you a sense of, you know, what is the, the total stock. I mean, I, I was kind of um, quite struck by the fact that the ONS is, as has been discussed, is already doing some work in this. For example, they have tried to calculate natural capital. They, they calculate it's worth around 761 billion over 100 years. Um, and that, that was then compared in some of the commentary to GDP, which is about, around that time, about 1.9 uh, trillion. But, the, the, but that is comparing a stock to a flow. It's comparing our, our year on year um, size of, uh, of our economy, whilst the, the total household wealth, let's say, is, is closer to, to 10 billion. So the natural um, capital is, is a component of our, our broader wealth, of course, but it's not the only component um, and it's not the only thing. That, that is going to be measured and be important. So I think you can, you can get into a bit of, I suppose, methodological confusion there. Um, I would also say, uh, and I know this has been a point that's been made um, throughout the panel, is, is this question, is all the policymakers focused on GDP growth? And I think that's been an assumption of this discussion. I'm not necessarily sure it's the case. Um, it's just, you know, over the last two years, policymakers very actively chose to shut down large sectors of the economy um, in the knowledge that GDP growth will be lower in order to prioritise human life. Uh, we have quite, uh, in this country, relatively high levels of taxes and growing levels of taxes. Um, you, I can make a strong argument that will reduce economic growth year on year, but that's because we want to fund public services. So I think these trade-offs are happening by policymakers. GDP is an important measure, and it's a, you could say maybe there's too much priority on it, but I don't think it's the only thing that policymakers are considering. I think they, they are trying to balance, and this is what this is the, the definition of public policy is making those trade-offs um, and, and trying to balance various pressures over time. That's right. We, we, we've heard that there, it's not just GDP, we just heard it there as well. I mean, there are a number, there's a raft of stats that you can look at as an economist, and the ONS produces a ton of them. So uh, do you not agree that we're, we're sort of arguing over how many angels can sit on the head of a pin slightly, in that this is a, this is a sort of academic debate, but in reality, the government looks at a whole range of statistics? I'd argue we're, we're arguing over how many countries can live in the donut mm -hmm. rather than angels on a pin because there is no country in the world that is currently meeting the needs of its people within its share of the means of the living planet because there's no country in the world that's yet actually making policy in that direction. And as long as we carry on saying what's the value of things that were bought and sold in our economy, we are a century away from where we need to but, be. But in you, you recognised earlier on in your evidence that, we should, that is still an important indicator. I want to say I didn't say it was an important indicator, and, I, and because I, I, what I noticed is I said yes, it tells you what's the through flow of monetized goods and services. That's, that's, that is an important fact. It's so, useful. Yeah. It's useful. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. But, but the danger is because I've left it on the table. It what always happens is it creeps back centre stage, and everything else is left peripheral. So that satellite accounts literally by name. I want to say it's not at all centre stage. The metrics I have here, and I wish I could show you because our eyes are incredibly important. The power of a number is I can say one number and it's a stat. If I can show you 
visuals, we can see so much more information with our eyes. But I'm not going to lift it up because I've been told not to. <laughs> well, you've got your mind set. However, the, there are so many other metrics that can guide us, and GDP is not one of those because I think it's not taking us there. Can I, can I just come in on a point you made about the natural capital and, and the desk crypto? I want to say very quickly that my concern with it is that it tries to add together natural capital and man-made produced capital and human capital. Who knows how you, you first you have to monetize those things. How do you put a price on those things and then add them together? So much valuable information that's been collected is lost when that gets squashed together. But secondly, as the ONS themselves say, in, in attempting to calculate the natural capital, they say, look, what we're doing is at least trying to put a price or a value on as much as we can. But I quote, the natural world supports all life on Earth, and its collapse would precipitate our own, implying infinite value. So our own Office of National Statistics is saying, hey, this thing that we've been asked to give a price and value to is of infinite value. Without a living world, there is no human activity, no life, no economy. It therefore does not belong as one category alongside all the others. It's the mothership on which we dwell. We can't just count it along other side, alongside other things we value. So to me, it does not make sense to try to add these things together. Thank you very much. Back to the chat. Thank you very much. And now, Claudia Webb, final set of questions. Thank you, Chair. And um, maybe, maybe I'll start with uh, Kate, because I just want to follow on, because you, you indicated actually that no country uh, in the world meets essentially the, the, the sustainable uh, development goals or the uh, planetary uh, uh, goals as well. Um, it, but, but in terms of your submission, you do say that Costa Rica comes pretty close yes. um, to doing so. So I just want you, if you can tell us, um, what are they doing right uh, compared to the worst performers, and where does the UK sit on this, uh, this, this, on this agenda? Thank you. So in our submission, we shared a graphic which takes account of nations' well-being of its people on, on an internationally comparable level. So it's not catching all the... the, the the, the relevant data we would want at home, but it's comparing how, how well a country is meeting the needs of their people, how well are they living within the means of the living planet. And it totally throws the ex received order that we normally think, um, I think the, the data that Matthew was quoting from the Yale Index of Environmental Performance had Denmark and Switzerland and Luxembourg at the top, Actually, if we take account of their global impact of carbon emissions and their material footprint, they fall way down because they, they, like the UK, are very significantly overshooting planetary boundaries. We are in big overshoot of our impact on the planet through everything that we're importing, and we need to radically come within. As you say, Costa Rica is one of the countries that is closer than many to meeting the needs of its people almost within the means of the living planet. So this is, to me, a real hope that it could be possible, because there are some countries in the world, without even actively aiming for it, that are closer. What's, what's, and what is it about those countries? There's been some really good academic research, and what they find is those countries that are closer, two big things in common. One, they invest in health and education and public transport. They provide the essentials of life. Two, they have a much fairer income distribution than other countries, which means that that nation's resources and that nation's GDP, when it's being spent, it's being spent more equitably by all on making their own lives thrive, rather than it's being spent by the hands of a few overshooting planetary boundaries with excessive consumption in their lifestyles. So it's, it, it comes home to sound policy of ensure everyone has the essentials of life, ensure your country does not become too unequal. This is the basic recipe mm. of a country that actually can live within the means of the planet and meet the needs of all its people. Mm. And, and just for the record, it, in terms of where the UK is? on the UK is uh, both, I'd say, given our level of income, we have higher than many in income inequality, so the inequality really stands out amongst in our social record, and we are overshooting multiple planetary boundaries. So we are up there with most all high-income countries. So all high-income countries really are overshooting their impact on the planet and radically need to transform. And to me, I will say, I say there's no country in the world that should say we're developed. I, I, I've never been to a country that should call itself a developed nation or an advanced country. Because overshooting planetary boundaries and running down the life support systems of our planet, that's, that's nothing developed or advanced about that. We are all on a transformative trajectory of 
change that we've never been on before. And that's why it calls for not only new policies, but definitely new metrics to guide us. Thank you. Um, Professor Moore, can I, can I just ask, what, 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 what um, alternative measures should governments uh, be introducing to prioritise uh, the social and ecological well-being? Well, um, we recently published something saying that actually we think that by the next election there should be a prosperity index, index for every parish in the United Kingdom, well, in parish in England, but in parish in the United Kingdom. So that, in other words, there should be a localised prosperity index, so you need to publish them for that. But in terms of what we could do, so at the moment we have a lot within our grasp, but we're not using what we have. So the, we now have GDP coming out quarterly, so why don't we have a range of other baskets of things coming out quarterly as well? So we could have one on water, for example. We could have one on carbon sequestration. We could have one on decent work. We could have one on biodiversity gain. The ONS is very close to having all of these. We could also have one, as it happens, on social capital. Social capital figurations by the ONS are very good and they're already doing the work on trust. We could have one on health. We could have one on domestic violence, which would make a very big difference in this country. Mm -hmm. And we could have one on air, right? And if we, and if I think probably no more than 10, they can come out quarterly along with the GDP figures. They can provide a way of aligning the public with what's going on in all of these areas. They could be published simultaneously, both at the national level and at the, and at the local level. And if I was allowed to say what I would like, I think we should have something called the State of the Nation, which should be released at Christmas time. And it should basically say what we've done in the last year, and then produce a few case studies around the things we have done, because there's so much good stuff going on in the United Kingdom. So we hope that by, say, August of this year, we'll have the first kind of platform go at that, of what we think are the major constraints and possibilities for, for, for prosperity in lots of different parts of the UK, so that we can then start building on it and working collaboratively with others to do that. But I think you, you could put... You, the UK is full of very, very talented people who understand how to do these complex things well. Put them together with the ONS and don't give them more than four months to come up with your ten that you want, right? And anyone who says it's very complicated and technically very difficult, don't put them on the committee, you know? <laughs> because the best is the enemy of the good, right? Mm -hmm. And just ask them, say, do it now, do it, you know, within... You know, by the time you come to sit again in the autumn, it'll be in place. And guess what? It can be an experiment. If you don't think it's doing a good job, then you change it. Well, you know, run it, run it for a year. You just have a state of the nation report, which would be state of the nations for every nation in the United Kingdom. That would be my suggestion. Thank you very much. And just finally, because I'm just, just aware of time, Matthew, if I could just ask, you've argued that pricing carbon is a more effective way of tackling climate change than reforming uh, GDP. Um, I, I mean, I suppose, uh, what are the advantages of, of, of uh, carbon tax? Well, I mean, re reforming GDP uh, is in itself not going to change anything in the, in the real world. It's a, it's a different way of looking at the world, you could argue, would lead to policy change. But in itself, I think it, I'd much prefer to, I suppose, jump to the policy change, which is taxing carbon. I mean, I, I think just... You know, very broadly speaking, taxing carbon is th just this very classic idea that um, in an economic transaction there might be a negative externality and that when you go buy a good, um, the, the negative externality should be um, priced. You should pay for the value of it in your good. I think there's, there's very strong evidence suggests that where we, where we have tax carbon or there's been pricing mechanisms, for example, in the UK's electricity market, it has actually led to very um, cost-effective decarbonisation and it encourages... Um, basically people and consumers and producers to change their behaviour, um, not just to pay the cost, but also change their behaviour in respect to innovating their production processes so that they don't have to pay as much of a carbon tax, um, producing new technologies and, and new um, energy technologies in more efficient ways. So I think there's massive benefits to using a, a carbon tax-based approach and kind of using the ability of, of markets that have given us all this economic growth and prosperity and, and focusing them in on dealing with the environmental costs of that when it comes to climate change. OK, thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Claudia. And that concludes our panel. I'd just thank our, like to thank our witnesses.